Welcome to this Google Plus discussion hosted by the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. I'm Zach Pakin. Today's topic is the future of the responsibility to protect doctrine in an increasingly multipolar world, and let's get right into it. Uh, joining us in Waterloo today, Waterloo, Ontario, Besma Momani, a professor at the Balsillie School of International Affairs at the University of Waterloo and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C. How are you today, Besma? Doing great, thank you. Excellent. And in Toronto, Ontario, Irvin Student, a professor at the University of Toronto's School of Public Policy and Governance and the founder of the magazine Global Brief. And it's with you, Irvin, that I'd like to start today. Why is the world fragmenting into blocks? Well, I think the world is fragmenting into blocks uh, of description to be determined, mind you, uh, for pretty obvious reasons. After the Second World War, the world concretized around two major poles. There was reasonable consolidation around those poles. Uh, for all intents and purposes, at least economically and geopolitically, the uh, West won the Cold War. That was the manifestation of the bipolar world after the Second World War. And now we're in a process of still extant disintegration of the uh, of the Cold War world into blocks that have yet to be determined and in governance forms that have yet to be determined. Uh, I'd like to apologize as well to our viewers for uh, the uh, situation in Toronto, Ontario. We've unfortunately got a, a bad line when it comes to the visibility. Uh, hopefully that will not affect uh, the content at all, but our apologies and a reminder as well uh, to our viewers that you can send in your questions online on Twitter using the hashtag MIGS2013, that is hashtag MIGS2013. Over to you, Besma. Do you believe that the multipolarity of the world is an inevitability? I think so. I mean, I think that it's bipolarity is more the abnorm uh, rather than the norm. And so multipolarity is, I think, uh, what we've seen and historically speaking has always been the case. Um, the challenge is, is really trying to identify what are the emerging sort of power states uh, and sort of always being on the pulse of things, we have to, with some humility, also uh, acknowledge that oftentimes we've gotten it wrong. I mean, I think many of us who sort of were around, at least a student of my time in the 80s and 90s, we were all told that Japan would be a rising significant power, and clearly I think many people today would say that that uh, didn't come to fruition. So I think that there's, you know, um, uh, an effort by many academics to sort of predict, and we're always uh, trying to be uh, kind of ahead of the game, uh, whether it's today the BRICS or increasingly the MIST as, as Goldman Sachs keeps coming up with new and new uh, acronyms, that being Mexico, uh, Indonesia, South Korea, and Turkey. Uh, we're all looking for sort of trying to recognize or acknowledge what are those rising powers. But yeah, I think multipolarity is, is more the norm rather than bipolarity, and it's a matter of just understanding which countries are up and which countries are down. Well, Irvin, modern-day multipolarity is often viewed synonymously with the relative decline of the United States. Uh, could you help us understand what the tangible consequences are of that relative decline? Well, first let's talk about the uh, the manifestations of that decline. First of all, there's an economic, a net economic decline, uh, relative weight, uh, particularly China. I'm very skeptical about the BRICS, and more skeptical about the MIST acronyms. They're elegant, but probably incoherent and analytically. Uh, there's a tangible economic decline. There's a cultural decline in, in, the, in the quality of the elites and leaders strategically and economically, uh, culturally in the United States. And last but not least, and more belatedly, uh, a net uh, geopolitical decline that is increasing diffidence in a number of theaters around the world playing more the commentariat. Uh, and I think Barack Obama is a good manifestation of that rather than uh, active intervener and a meaningful uh, player. The consequences of the, uh, of the decline in the multipolarity are that uh, the world is less predictable, as it were. There is no uh, fixed game. It's, it's indefinite. The uh, basic assumptions of the various players are, are unclear or still being formed. The uh, propensity for risk-taking, geopolitically speaking, uh, is uh, often difficult to determine. So analytically, it's a very, very delicate world, and, and I think as Besma accurately points out, we ought to be humble in, in, in figuring out what the narrative is, or partly in actor role and partly in, in observer role, and I think that's true of, of even the, the, the top powers. Uh, Besma, are global, regional, and civil wars more likely in a multipolar system, in a unipolar system, or a bipolar one? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, I guess there's, you know, international uh, relations theory, and, and I'm by no means an IR theory person, but if I remember my undergrad very well, um, I think the argument is that bipolarity somehow keeps things more stable. Um, you know, it all depends on where you stand. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, in trying to to understand the United States role, uh, we're often looking for hot conflicts rather than latent conflicts. Uh, you know, we're increasingly thinking about civil wars as not really on the same radar as, for example, interstate wars. So, uh, you know, it really depends on what you're looking for. I mean, I think the, the, the question should be sort of broader than to say, you know, do you think the world is going to be full of more conflict or less conflict? Um, you know, I think I, I, I'm also a, a student of, of um, you know, uh, being a good empiricist in the sense that I think the more we have better tools at our disposal to both uh, identify and analyze conflict, we're going to see more of it. Um, and so you kind of get that with what's going on in social media. You, you can't help but feel that there are these just new social movements out there that have never existed before. Yes, it's true that social media has brought more to the fore, but I don't think that those those conflicts or those forms of opposition never existed. I just think that we're now being able to identify them. I look at, for example, China today, um, and people say, "Oh, it's you know, it's there, there's more protests than before, and this is something new." No, I mean, China has always had many protests in the rural side, in 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 the city center. We just know about it more because it's hard in our interconnected world to escape it. I mean, you know, in the in the lens of the international media, we're able to be more cognizant of all those conflicts that are arising. So I guess, you know, I, I, I think it's it's interesting to note that, you know, we don't, trying to compare things now to the Cold War is almost like apples and oranges. It's really difficult to compare what happened in the 50s to today. I mean, I think uh, something happens in the most faraway places of conflict, we all find out about it so quickly. So. It's easy to to think that somehow the world is up in flames today because um, we you know we're in a, this ungovernable multipolarity system. But I think it's really about our eyes and ears are more open than ever thanks to what we're on right now, which is this great interconnected world. Uh, Urban, the uh, term realpolitik is often used to describe foreign policies that are based more on raw interests than on norms or values. Does increased global multipolarity, in your opinion, mean more foreign policies based on realpolitik across the world, or fewer? That's a really good question and, and a difficult one. Um, let me go back and just take advantage of, of, of the opportunity to jump on the, on the last question, and, and maybe that will lead into the current one. Uh, in respect of whether uh, multipolarity will yield or issue in more conflict internal or external, uh, my conjecture is that we're at the best moment in recent history, it can only get worse. Uh, and I think I'll probably preface some of the later remarks by saying I think our goal, this is outside of Canada but anywhere in terms of the geopolitical imperatives is to keep the great powers from going to war against one another. And when they stop, when they're stopped from going to war against one another, the casualty count, the body count is minimized. And that includes even the great civil wars. But as soon as Russia and China and the United States go to war head to head, which thankfully has not happened in 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 a, in a, in a great deal of time, uh, then we're in trouble. But we're far away from that still. We're probably at the most peaceable moment in 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 uh, in recent history. Uh, if you go on the, the Steven Pinker thesis, I, I buy that uh, wholeheartedly. So it can only get worse. Now, will the calculations be increasingly real politique or value laden? Uh, if you were talking about the, the Western case, I think we're confused. If you talk about the Eastern world, what I call the algorithmic world, the sinophilic world, they're much more uh, hard headed, they're very pragmatic. It is real politique, it is what the national interest is. Uh, they have extremely talented elites that are making that calculation, that are poking at the West to test our metal. In the Western case, and R2P is perhaps a case of this, uh, we're sometimes confused about where we ought to go, what we can do, and, 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 what, and what really uh, is the, the local national interest. Of course, it varies from country to country, but we have pretty much 
uh, folded to the American narrative that there is uh, an objective good out there that's universalizable and that we ought to go for it irrespective of the consequence on the ground. So let me put it that way. There's a Western moralistic world uh, that will meet its match in, in reality. There is an algorithmic Eastern world that is much more uh, cold-blooded, pragmatic, and, and real politic laden uh, that may appear cynical, but for now is, is carving a very serious niche for itself in the world. Uh, you mentioned R2P. Let's pick up on that right now. Uh, the responsibility to protect doctrine was adopted unanimously by the United Nations uh, World Summit in 2005 in an attempt to redefine sovereignty as a responsibility and to clarify the rules under which the international community could intervene to halt mass atrocities. Besma, if more and more uh, foreign policies across the world are going to be based on realpolitik, does realpolitik give room for R2P in a foreign policy? Good questions, Hack. Um, you know, I think, look, I mean, R2P, yes, it's it's uh, a concept that I think uh, so many of us wish <laughs> would come to fruition. But, you know, I think it's not, it, it's, it's almost a fantasy in a sense to think of it actually having been implemented. I mean, I, I haven't seen R2P work in many cases. Um, it, you know, we still see countries... World powers intervene when it's their interest, and, and in, in Libya, R2P worked, and in Syria, it's not working, and that's because they're very two different interests and complications and challenges. So, I mean, the very premise of the idea that somehow R2P is a given just because we signed uh, something, you know, um, internationally is, is, I think, idealistic at that. Um, you know, I think that there is going to be more and more, and, and the basis of R2P really came recognizing that there is increasingly more internal conflict than interstate conflict. Um, and I think that's absolutely true. Uh, and we see that evidence today uh, throughout the world. Um, so I think that the tools uh, that we need are definitely ones that have to marry both very strong diplomatic uh, capability with still the viability of a military power to, to really uh, beef up the, 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 the threat, so to speak, to, to, to warring parties. Um, but, you know, I think that going back to what Urban noted at the beginning, you know, watching the United States, for example, under the Obama administration, really, I think, um, taking a back seat, and, and whether it's leading from behind or uh, call it what you will, or pivot to Asia, I think it's pivot to things that are easy, <laughs> achievable, um, call it what you will, but the fact that we don't have a superpower um, really willing to, to, to back up R2P with might, is obviously going to change the calculus on the ground, and, and we see that today, I think, in Syria most vividly. Um, you know, uh, Assad regime thinks it has the carte blanche to do whatever it, it can and will, uh, knowing that nobody wants to go in. And the future of military powers, the military powers that exist out there, um, particularly I think the United States and Europe, are, are cash-strapped. And, you know, economies that are cash-strapped are increasingly introverted, they become more isolationist, they become more focused on investing on the home front, um, and we're seeing all evidence of that, and at the same time, uh, you know, to the to sort of the other powers that are rising, I don't, I don't know if the Chinese are really interested in um, intervening globally, uh, not just because obviously they would be the biggest hypocrites because they need R2P at home before anybody, uh, but increasingly I think they're also not interested in, in military ventures that will undermine their economic progress. Um, and to them, the greatest threat is still a domestic one. In other words, they have to feed the appetites of millions and millions of people, particularly those migrating to the urban centers by providing them jobs. And um, that comes first. That's the number one threat, security threat. So I just, I think that there's a lot of hope on R2P principle, and I wish it was, um, you know, adopted thoroughly, but I think there's a lot of uh, idealism in that concept, and um, that would point out that I think there's going to be more of this kind of interstate, or I should say internal, kind of civil strife that we unfortunately see so much of, uh, particularly uh, what we're witnessing in Syria today. Uh, Russia and China uh, asserting their obstructionist position on the Security Council vis-a-vis -vis Syria seems to be rocking R2P to its core. Uh, do we believe that it's in the Western interest to preserve R2P? Let's get both of your opinions on that, starting with Irvin. Uh, 
let me go back because I'm going to make it a, a, a habit of jumping on on uh, Besma's excellent questions and excellent interventions because I have uh, a view too, and then I'm going to use that to leapfrog to your excellent questions. So I can keep them. If you want to do that as well, feel free to jump in at any point in time. Thank you. Uh, will multipolarity uh, be the death or the birth pang of R2P? And then let's go to Russia, China. Because they're, they're quite related. Um, I think, of course, in the West and certainly in academic circles, maybe in political circles too, we parody, and Zach, you would know this better than most, we parody R2P into pure military intervention in the name of some higher uh, virtue. And of course, if you read uh, people like Axworthy, Ignatiev, Dallaire, who were uh, Ramesh the core people were at the at the founding uh, stages of, of the RTP doctrine they would say well what is uh, suppressed probably for worse not for better is the more elegant nuanced diplomatic side of R2P that is to say you see a conflict coming you need to have two things uh, in store in order to staunch it one is you have to have the analytical chops and two, you need to be able to intervene diplomatically before uh, the cat gets out of the bag. And in the Syria case, obviously, that hasn't happened, and that may not happen in other more significant conflicts. I think in that case, multipolarity is in no way uh, existing in contradiction or to the detriment of, of R2P, quite, quite the contrary. I think you'll have different analytical traditions that will spot conflicts from different angles. There's nothing to say that Western analytics are superior, far from it, to, to Eastern anal analytics or post-Soviet analytics. And I would say Western diplomacy is today weaker than certainly Asian diplomacy uh, in the R2P space. For instance, I think, uh, as I've written elsewhere, the next Nobel Prize or, the, or two Nobel Prizes from now will likely go to the Malaysian Prime Minister. Why Malaysia? Because Malaysia seems to have just... Uh, almost brokered a, a, a deal in the southern Philippines that will affect millions and millions of lives with the Moro Islamic uh, Liberation Front and, and Mindanao. Now, that's not maybe on the radar screen here, but that strikes me as very much an R2P type intervention without the articulation of R2P a, a, as the doctrine, but they are trying to save lives from a brutal uh, domestic conflict. Uh, they know that military intervention hasn't worked and full-fledged military intervention will yield more blood uh, than virtue. Moving to Russia and China, uh, if you look at diplomatic intervention in that space, Russia and China have probably brokered more quote-unquote peace deals than the West has in the last 20 years, simply because of their, the space that they occupy territorially, their complex borders, and the seriousness with which they take the diplomatic vocation. So they don't go out and, and say 10 years out, we're going to bring Israel-Palestine to, to peace. And that's a very pedantic, non-Asian approach. They go underground and they, they bring the players together. They break bread. They drink vodka. Uh, in, in, in China, they, they, would, they, would, they, would, they would break bread. And they, they broker conflicts. They don't win Nobel Peace Prizes and they don't talk about R2P, but they are very much in the game of geopolitical stability. And if the R2P game is to minimize uh, body counts, then they are very much of that ilk. What they would disagree with, and this is the this is the Russia and China position on Syria, I have some sympathy with it, although I don't think that's their game is pure. Mind you, no states have a pure game in international affairs, is that to say. Uh, look at Libya. W was that a virtuous intervention, or has that yielded more body bags after the fact than ex ante? Uh, they would say that it has yielded more body bags. I think Dallaire said as much in his last Global Brief interview. So they say, wait a minute, let's be humble. Yeah, of course, they're interested in, in, in obstructing American power, but they are also interested in preventing uh, what I suggested at the outset was the key geopolitical imperative, is that big states ought not to go to war with one another, and awkward military interventions can very much yield that outcome. Before we go over to Besma, a quick follow-up uh, for you, Irvin. Uh, we talk about the West and their interest in preserving R2P. Is the West in the 21st century a united bloc anymore, or are North America and Europe very separate geopolitical actors? That's a great question. Are, are Canada and the United States united also in, in this century? What about, what about uh, Latin America, Central America? Uh, to be determined, Europe is, I think, in value terms, it, its own project. It is a virtuous domestic project, probably, uh, if, if, if I may be loose with the language, the most uh, laudable R2P 
example that, that we can find over the last century. That is to unite now 28 countries in peace and economic and social uh, cohesion is a remarkable achievement because when Europe explodes, uh, we're, we're in trouble. So Europe has its own value set domestically. It is impotent, altogether impotent internationally. Now, the United States has its own value set domestically. It's far from impotent internationally. So because of the, the latter fact, it will trump Europe uh, whatever happens in international behavior. It will clash, however, with China and Russia, which have their own traditions and their own uh, geopolitical extroversion. Uh, Besma, if you could provide us with some food for thought by any chance, by any chance in addition to the food that's going into your stomach, uh, we would uh, love to hear as well your opinion on whether you think the West's interest, quote unquote, is in preserving R2P in the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think it's it's in the world's interest to preserve R2P. I mean, saying that it's an idealistic goal doesn't mean it's worth fighting for. Um, it's just that it's full of challenges, and I think that um, you know, Urban's really laid out a lot of uh, a lot of the key drivers, and and um, I think some of the key architects and, and many who I've known in the past, you know, had really good have really good intentions in wanting to move this forward. And I don't think, you know, I, I'm not one of these people that that thinks it's uh, inherently problematic. I just think it's full of challenges to, to actually see to fruition. I mean, again, um, you can't help but, but follow what's going on in Syria today, which has clearly you know, uh, been uh, a rampage of, of 100,000 dead, um, millions and millions uh, displaced, and there's no one to stop it. Um, and again, uh, I think that with the Libya case, which I know a lot of people have made uh, comparisons to, uh, and you know it's very funny because I spent evening yesterday with many Libyan friends um, who are by no means lamenting you know, the days of Gaddafi and and feel very much that in fact uh, it was a a war of their own that it was worth fighting for that uh, it was an intervention that uh, was just and so you know I. I with all due respect to a lot of people who, um, from the outside, have been able to look at this with and say yes, that there was um, potentially more killed than you know than we would have liked for sure. But a lot of that also was at the hands of, of Libyan versus Libyan conflict, uh, not at the hands of NATO. Um, does that mean that NATO can't learn to improve? Uh, absolutely, I think there's lots of lessons to be to be learned. But I just, you know, the fact that there's that Libyans are still celebrating and are very happy. Um, their their day to day life is much better. There is insecurity at night. I know that, you know, a couple of friends that I was speaking to was it were arguing that, you know, in, in under Gaddafi, women used to be able to walk at night a lot more freely. Today, it's, it's a little more difficult. But people's uh, uh, thought process, their their ability to even their their economic situation is even better. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're they're pretty happy. Uh, they're they're stoked, frankly, and you know, I think that that means something. Um, yes, his inner circle may not be happy, but and this and this her people that I talked to were from actually a town that was identified as you know a stronghold of Qaddafi. So, you know, uh, other friends of mine from Tripoli or from Benghazi. Are, are thrilled to bits. I mean, you know, there's just no comparison. So, it was it was a fight well worth it. Um, and I think that uh, as long as the Libyan people and, and they are again at the end of the day, they're the arbiters, the only arbiters of whether or not it was successful. Um, and I think many of them would say it was. And so that to me is is frankly good enough. Thank you very much. Can I jump in a bit? Uh, of you viewers who are just tuning in right now, uh, that uh, you can uh, send in your questions. Is online to hashtag MIGS2013. Irvin, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I, want, I wanted to add uh, to Besma's terrific remarks that I think maybe we'll get there, and I, so I don't want to uh, jump the gun. The imperative on R2P is to avoid as much as possible outright military interventions and takeovers of countries. That is a sign of, of procedural failure uh, from the West or the East. And, and, and I guess, you know, the, the China-Russia position reduces to that, which is to say, let's not go for the failing option, which is outright intervention, which will probably yield in the aggregate uh, more body bags that, than, than it will save. So the uh, 
the imperative for us as we look at future R2P interventions, and I am an advocate of R2P. If I look back at the, the, the Holocaust of the Second World War, I keep scratching my head as an analyst saying, who would go to war with Germany in, in defense of the Jews and other disenfranchised people who, who were getting uh, prepared for slaughter? And I, and I dare say very few people would go in that name. And it would be very difficult for an advisor to the top powers to make that case, even on today's rationality. But to fast forward to the 21st century, the imperative for R2P advocates is twofold. One is to improve our analytical chops, to be much more humble about what we think we understand, to be much more prolific and eclectic and, dare I say, promiscuous on languages. I think our language capabilities in the West stink. Uh, and then on intervention, the intervention must be in the first instance diplomatic and well before the conflict starts. We have to have deep relationships with all sides. Uh, very amoral relationships, they're functional relationships, and this goes to Iran just as it does with North Korea and China. We need to have tentacles in there so that we know the numbers to call. Even in the Cold War, the relationships were thicker and less moralistic in many cases uh, than they are today diplomatically because they knew that the imperative was to stop mass bloodshed. Today, uh, because we're not living in a world of, of mass bloodshed in the aggregate, and the West has won the Cold War, we're hyper-moralistic. So we, we withdraw from the vocation of diplomacy, which is to establish relationships with your enemies, first and foremost, and secondly, with those that may cause you harm through their uh, behavior. So I think that, that if we can emphasize those two, we can avoid the need for mass military intervention, which, whatever happens, as Clausewitz says, results in some description of hell, and it can't be controlled one way or another, however, uh, no, NATO perfects or does not perfect its act. Um, let's get into a few of the questions that have to do with uh, the specifics of, preser of preserving the norm of R2P. Uh, Irvin, let's start with you on this one. Uh, with regards to Russian and Chinese interests versus Western ones, or even those of other emerging powers, in a multipolar world, do we expect powers' interests to be opposed to one another, or is there room for cooperation? And mention and talk about R2P in particular. So another great question. Keep them coming. Uh, I think that I like the world. I like the word, and I, it, I use it with with reluctance with students. Strategic promiscuity. We in the West need to be much more strategically promiscuous. We need to dance with all sorts of partners on different projects, and we need not to be, uh, as it were, thick in establishing barriers between uh, our our transaction with Party A on 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 Project X and then with Party A and pro on Project Y. We may be on side and, and the Russians and the Chinese are much less dogmatic, believe it or not, than that. They, we call, it, call them cynical, they just call themselves uh, pragmatic and the Russians are far more cynical than the Chinese there who, who are very pragmatic. I think we need to be much more eclectic. There is no uh, there's no interest in, in, in for the West or and no benefit for the West in avoiding many transactions productive transaction with the Chinese and the Russians. They cover a huge geopolitical, cultural, civilizational space. We ought to be doing it regularly. We'll, where we disagree, we just ought not to be going on CNN and CBC and, and demonizing them as, as morally inferior to us. Just say we agree on points of principle and they'll respect that that as well. And we can have offline discussion with that. But that's how mature countries and civilizations carry themselves. So I, I see room for all sorts of transactions. I think, if I understand the Chinese calculation correctly, is that they want to avoid frontal war, at least not in, in, at least until they're ahead. Uh, in the Russian case, it's much more uh, unstable because their analytics are not as good as they used to be. Their elites are not as stable as they used to be, and in part, they still have the traditional pragmatic opposition to the West. But there is a cynical anti-Americanism there, just as there is a cynical anti anti or uh, Russophobia in in parts of, of the West. And that has to be checked. But I, I see no contradiction with functional relationships, uh, opportunistic ones, dare I say promiscuous ones, on all sorts of files. Uh, Besma, where do you see countries like India and Brazil fitting into the mm -hmm. equation? Are these constructive players in the new world order and in preserving R2P in particular? I mean, I think the Brazilians in their own region are very, uh, very much active. Uh, absolutely. I think that they are. Um, uh, interested in, in being involved. I mean, the barrier there, however, remains a linguistic one, being a Portuguese-speaking country and much of uh, South Africa, South America and, and Latin America being, of course, Spanish. So there's, you know, rivalry between the Brazilians and the Mexicans um, for sort of leadership of the region. 
the uh, Brazilians have worked very hard to paint the Mexicans as basically American lackeys, um, and pretty much the um, um, uh, you know again the, the the Mexicans are really trying to take the advantage of being um, the, the strongest I think uh, English sorry Spanish speaking country in the region uh, financially at least. I think that there's um, less uh, mobility or less uh, opportunity, I should say, for India to really play a powerful role in the region, partly because, again, it has so much domestic um, issues at its at its door: um, huge poverty, uh, corruption. Um, you know, the biggest democracy, but full of really corrupt practices, and and, and it's really eating at the core of so many uh, Indian people and society. And huge disparities of, of uh, wealth and income, more billionaires in India than anywhere else, and yet huge underclass of society. So they've got problems at home, and I think when countries uh, tend to have a lot of domestic challenges, they're going to be less ambitious on the external front, and that's, I think, very a natural reaction. So I don't think we should expect a lot of India, um, you know, sort of the India of, of the past that really was um, uh, overly interventionist on its borders, I think, is become uh, more subdued as time goes on. And of course, it still has a strategic interest in supporting, uh, you know, the Tamils. It still has a strategic interest in, um, in, in I think, its, um, um, its relationship with China. But I think all of that has, I think, uh, been now suppressed for more internal concerns about trying to develop the societies and bring them up to par with the kinds of, of living standards that so many Indians want to see. Um, I think that they uh, really want to see the middle class achieve the kinds of goals that so many people want. Um, aspiring uh, uh, people to, you know, very educated and, and obviously have a lot of opportunities that they would like to pursue um, and don't want to see, you know, very scarce resources uh, used to sort of pursue external adventure. So I think there's going to be an introverted sense in India for some time until I think we really see a rise of that middle class uh, to a level that they're happy with. Uh, Urban, how much do you think that the U.S.-China relationship is going to dominate international affairs in the 21st century? I think for the first 50 years, uh, yeah, I'm going to be so immodest as to project 50 years out and say it's going to be the dominant relationship for the foreseeable future. But, but um, perhaps in a different way than 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 the uh, Western Soviet one. The the Chinese don't have an expansionist projects. They they never did. Theirs is more uh, the gravity of of their civilization. They are an attractive culture. Uh, we want to mimic them because they're they are great historically and they're doing great things today. Uh, I I like to say. If we look at the historic achievement in, in Toronto of having agreed to expand the subway uh, system two stops eastward to Scarborough, and in the space of that time, the Ch China would have populated their entire eastern seaboard with Triangle Vitesse. So uh, when they get going, China is the most serious player by by leagues in the, in the BRICS formulation. So I, I think it'll be an important one. I, I dare say there will be conflict. Will it be proxy conflict, direct conflict? Uh, will be tied to the world if, if there is direct conflict between China and the United States because at that point China will be very militarily mature, the interdependencies will be thick. I think North America for the first time in, in uh, about a century and a half will be vulnerable territorially to uh, military attack. Of course there's a cyber dimension, uh, but I think it's a different type, it has got a different character, the bipolar relation between China and the United States and that they're not expansionist the 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 cynophilic world they are they are more uh, uh, if you will almost like like uh, parts of the old Persian Empire uh, pulsating things that are to be uh, mimicked uh, if I may also go back to, to the BRICS uh, the other two parties in the BRICS so if I say China is the most serious in the BRICS the most uh, dangerous one is Russia in the negative because if Russia destabilizes I think that destabilizes the entire world that's the story of of modern history. So China may destabilize through active behavior, Russia through instability, and I really don't see Brazil and India anywhere in the same league at, at all. India is, Bessemer's quite right, uh, ultimately an introverted player. They just don't have the tentacles to uh, 
to be extroverted. Their their civil service, their dip diplomatic corps is smaller than China than Canada's in the end for all our attrition. And there's no sign that they'll be able to get their domestic bulwark in order to be much more ambitious than that. Brazil is an unknown quantity because it's got a great deal of, of dead weight bringing down any extroverted ambitions. Certainly they are the number one or two player in Latin America, uh, but I don't see them being more than a continental player and they shouldn't be bigger than, than Canada this century. Uh, one more quick question for each of you before we move over to our final topic uh, of the afternoon. Uh, Irvin, you talked a little bit about the omnipresence uh, of that bipolar relationship between the U.S. and China over the coming years. Is that omnipresence a good thing or a bad thing for R2P advocates? A good question and a, and a tough question. Mm -hmm. It depends. Well, let me go back to my first point. I think the best way in which R2P can manifest itself in that type of bipolar world is to prevent war between the United States and China directly or between proxies thereof for the next 50 years. Whether we can maintain that equilibrium for the next 100 years, uh, I have my doubts. It would be a historical to posit that great powers won't in some ways clash uh, before long. But I think that's the purest sense. So keep the big powers from going to war or their, their immediate proxies from going to war. Beyond that, as I say, I think China is doing for now a better job at RTP than the United States. They've got more diplomatic tentacles out there. Uh, they are learning languages much more than we are in the West, uh, very seriously. So if we are quote-unquote pivoting to Asia, China's pivoted to the West a long time ago, uh, re-engineered all our projects, learned our languages, studied in our universities, understood our mentality. We haven't done the reverse. And so they're doing the ex-ante diplomatic work and analytics where we're not. They've still got huge mistakes. I mean, look if you look at their behavior in the South China Sea, there you have potential recipes for or many, many body bags if, if China is overly provocative and if, if through miscalculation a, a, a war begins. In the Western case, I, I think uh, we have longevity on our side. Our systems are quite stable. Our cult political cultures are very pliant and uh, resilient. I think we need to be more humble and really get our hands dirty in R2P uh, friendly capabilities, starting again with analytics. Look at Canada's pivot to the Americas, as Bessemer was intimating, in 2007. The pivot was uh, done in the absence of any sensitivity to the culture or language of the region at all, because apparently we do open federalism, so foreign policy does not include the, the imperative of learning foreign languages at the school level, which is, frankly, a diplomatic nonsense. If you look at the, the pivot to Asia that the West has done, outside of Australia, there's been no serious pivot that has really gotten to the bowels of Asian languages at all. So these are non-pivots in their facts, whereas China, when they pivot, they pivot quite seriously. I don't want to do a hagiography of the East, because I'm not, I don't think they're all that great, but what they do, they do with great seriousness, and it is much more R2P friendly uh, than we might fancy. Uh, Besma, if you could give us a quick answer to the following question. Uh, the UN was created uh, under a bipolar world order under a framework of collective security. If we want to talk about human rights in a multipolar world order, do we need new institutions? No. Do you want me to elaborate? No. <laughs> that's it, that's all. Okay. Well, would you like to add it all? Uh, we'll take a few seconds to add to that or no? Yeah, no, I'll add. I'm just joking. Uh, I think <laughs> institutions are, are really hard to create, and so we, we always need to remem remember that it's much easier to to modify and, and reform. Um, and I say that by prefacing that the UN reform agenda, which I have been watching for a decade now, just seems uh, to get messier and messier, but still worthwhile. Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, uh, we can look at perhaps something like the G20, which is a new forum to really um, uh, perhaps bring these uh, more uh, systematic, st systematically important countries into uh, some conversation about these issues. Uh, I think that ultimately, um, you know, we, if we look at uh, international cooperation, you know, we're doing a lot better than we were 50 years ago, and so as much as you know, the UN was a great achievement under Biden. <coughs> uh, our multipolar system has done, you know, I think some interesting things as well, and the G20 being one of them, um, that we have been able to uh, get uh, various parties together to agree on restabilizing the world economy is quite uh, promising. Now, 
uh, obviously the more technical um, and the more of a public good kind of issue uh, like the global economy, the more consensus and more cooperation we're going to get, the more difficult it is to talk about things like human rights and um, uh, agreeing on whether it's intervention in X or Y um, countries. Those are obviously the more difficult ones. And so the G20 hasn't been very successful on those. But I think that ultimately we don't need new institutions. We just need to, um, I think, reform them, make them um, more applicable to the contours mm -hmm. of the international political economy or international global security or whatever issue area it is. And, and that, in that sense, I think um, adapting and reform institutions is a lot better than starting from anew. Uh, in our last 10 to 15 minutes here, I'd like to talk a little bit about Canadian foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis R2P going forward. Uh, Irvin, in your opinion, if you are Canada, what is your grand strategy and its major pillars in the 21st century? That's a great question. I am just going to answer the second, the, the, the last question quickly on institutions. I agree with Bessema. We don't need uh, new formal institutions, perhaps. I mean, some innovation here and, here and there on, on technical questions. Uh, but it all depends, of course, on w what we mean by institutions. If you look at, at the classics like Hedley Bull, the anarchical society, he would say that the multipolar world is a new institution, and, and war and peace are institutions. And these are these are pushes and pulls on, on the international world that I think in China probably understands a little bit more than in the West, where we are probably more pedantic in saying there's a, a problem that needs to be solved. Let's set up a, a rational framework and consensus around it. I think the the Sinophilic mind is a little bit more flexible saying let's go with the flow this is the new world and let's let's operate with it uh, and I think we can be this is a good segue to the Canadian question we can be a little bit more nimble uh, Canadian foreign policy uh, I would like to flip the proposition on its head and say that for the next 10 to 15 years our, our imperative ought to be to focus on means not ends uh, you know, if you go to Ottawa, the, the, it's a mugs game, and whatever p government gets into power asks, well, what's our national project? What's the projet de société? What do we want to do in the world? And I would say that it's the prerogative of any government to decide what it wants to do in the world given the circumstance. So that, that's almost uninteresting because you'll never get a national consensus in a big, complicated country like Canada on what the project has to be. But the means to succeed on any project we may choose are uncontroversial. They're analytical chops. They're a great diplomatic force. They're a great military. They're a great supporting a academic and an analytical army. Intelligence, uh, an industrial complex that can can support that type of activity. Relationships, and all of these things are, I would say, dissipated and and weak in today's Canada because for the last, I would say. Maybe since the end, the end of the, well, no, since we started killing the budget in the 90s, we've been talking to ourselves on foreign policy and feeling quite good about it. Uh, but but there's, because there's no pressure on us to perform, uh, we've those all of those means for success will compromise the ability of any future ambitious government to achieve its ends. So the, but if you talk about what our relationship grand strategy is, it's what I would have called in a previous Global Brief article, the acre strategy. Uh, it's much more interesting than BRICS. It is A-C-R-E. It is the Arctic in the north. Oh, sorry. A is America, and, and if you will, the larger Americas through the United States. C is China, which is a proxy for the whole uh, Eastern world, the Sinophilic world. R is Russia, because Russia is the Russia, is the Arctic game, so we need to get closer to Russia and, and start to, uh, as it were, divide the pie and, and work with them for an entree into the, the E part of Acre, which is Europe. Uh, we want to keep Europe together. That is a key Canadian interest. It is an R2P interest because once Europe collapses, that's a problem. We want to keep Russia from being offside of the West and Europe too uh, expansively. So that is the Russian interest. And I think there is an opening, Putin or not, for us to really cultivate a deep, non-dogmatic relationship with Russia. They would be open to that. I think they quite like us. They see us as northern people. Perhaps they're a little suspicious that we are... Uh, too pro-American, but not as suspicious as we might fancy. I think they'd be open to that. Can we can we muster enough diplomatic chutzpah to, to be able to, to open that relationship? I think it would yield a lot of diplomatic fruit for us, or strategic fruit. Good stuff. The uh, China Bessemer, game is... Uh, if if the, I could step in, because we've only got about 10 minutes left. So, yeah, Bessemer, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, in your opinion, where, does, uh, where do efforts to preserve R2P on the global stage fit into Canadian foreign policy and grand strategy going forward? <laughs> 
I think it would be a shame if we were to not take it and, and really move forward with it as much as possible. I mean, I, and unfortunately, seeing the current government kind of back away from it in some way um, is a shame. I mean, it, it's 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 a part of our history, our diplomatic history, and we should be very proud of it. Um, and I think that these things should not be politicized or become partisan. Um, and unfortunately, I think increasingly, um, the current government has taken some of these issues and, and made them a little too partisan for my liking. R2P is at its core, uh, I think, a really a Canadian, Canadian proposal in the sense that it reflects everything I think we are, uh, which is you know consensus based that we care about um, the world, that we want to prevent conflict, that we uh, want to use our diplomatic muscle first and foremost. Uh, and I totally agree with Irvin that it's it's you know it's important to look at it as as a diplomatic a precursor before you go into to the military one. That doesn't mean, again, it's an idealistic goal we're fighting for. It's full of challenges. Uh, it can be uh, used hypocritically, which we, we continue to see. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's not worthy of developing and, and one day securing. Um, you know, clearly, without a sort of independent global um, actor that can implement this, um, be it an army or otherwise, it, it obviously becomes very difficult to, to um, materialize. But I think NATO is becoming that 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 role. Um, it's becoming that new actor um, that can perhaps I think bring teeth to R2P. Uh, the challenge there, which we haven't talked about, it maybe is worth talking about one day, which is the expansion of NATO. Um, looking at it as more, it's already started. I mean, we've already started to see the sort of raison d'être of NATO change to more out of area focus. Um, uh, but I think also in terms of its membership, I think it needs to um, really become more than just uh, uh, the current partners and to think about trying to bring some of these countries into the fold who want to be a part of a liberal order to preserve and, and maintain world peace and I think that we can do that and I think Canada brings a lot of a lot of uh, real I think uh, intellectual heavyweights to not only R2P but to the whole judicial process um, out there that commands the kind of respect that we deserve and I hope that uh, it's a project that we continue to, to pursue regardless of what political parties in power. Gotcha. Uh, Irvin, do you think that Canada requires more geopolitical weight than it has right now in order to lead international efforts to preserve our 2P? Oh, 100%. I think we, we need more geopolitical weight, period, to achieve any end that we, we put our minds to and that these are our, uh, basic national interest sense all the way to more I would say prudential ends like R2P. We need weight in in the world. You need the basic assets. Now I think in the current instance the Canadian side he says well why would we want weight? Life is good. Weight costs money, it comes with risks. Uh, dare I say I think that is a residue of, of colonial baggage. We're still in a psychological cage which posits that we're a small country that more authoritative countries have the geopolitical weight and somehow we've created a, a very good spot for ourselves, let's defend it. I think, however, that the virtue position of creating weight in order to advance R2P will coincide uh, by mid-century with the more base interest of creating weight in order to defend ourselves because the world is changing, as Best and, and, and I and, and you, Zach, have been discussing the world will, I think, begin to put more pressure on Canada. If since 1871 we haven't had any threats on our borders, the Arctic is fast melting, we're going to have for the first time in uh, a century and a half a new porous border. That creates a different psychology, a different type of pressure. We're going to need to be up to the challenge of protecting that uh, one way or another. No one's going to protect it for us. And we need to, need to be serious with serious players. If I could so, jump in here, actually, on that point, Irvin, uh, with, with regards to the Northwest Passage and the Arctic thawing in general, is that going to prove to be too much of a distraction and an existential problem for Canada going forward to even think about focusing on R2P-related issues? I don't think so. I think, actually, it will, uh, for people who are worried about this stuff, uh, be a bit of a blessing because it will cause us to be a serious country. To, to really uh, put our, our money where our mouths are and, and to defend ourselves in ways that other uh, 
uh, countries know to, to feel viscerally. Take Iran, Israel, China, India, Russia. These are all countries that have serious strategic elites uh, that would make you frankly cry in juxtaposition to some of our strategic elites because uh, they take the task seriously and failure means the end of the country in many cases, certainly the end of the government. Uh, for instance, if Israel loses a strategic war, Israel doesn't exist. If uh, Russia loses a strategic war, uh, the world destabilizes. These are all visceral threats that we don't feel in, in the gut of our elites. So as I think I said in a recent article, the Prime Minister in principle, and this is not the current Prime Minister, this is all of our Prime Ministers because we all grow up in the same stew. A Prime Minister can in principle declare a war on a far off country today and not feeling the seriousness of the war go off to Tim's and grab a coffee and talk about other topics. This betrays a non-seriousness. But if you've got the Arctic melted and you have the other at your at your doorstep as it were then you have to uh, survive and you need to that changes the psychology and that type of psychology will make a series on the R2P file if governments decide to pursue it. Now I think it is worthy of pursuit because I, I believe in the Talmudic aphorism that you save one life you save the world entire but you, that is against the, the more Anglo-Saxon functional argument which is let's save more lives than we lose so I think there's a virtue ethics argument uh, there but the means to that end are, are the same as they are for the Arctic. And Besma some uh, final thoughts from you uh, if you uh, may uh, with regards to uh, what Irvin just spoke about uh, he spoke about uh, a, a different world in terms of our different world view rather excuse me uh, when it comes uh, to Canada's foreign policy in the 21st century going forward, we have to fundamentally change the way we view ourselves. Uh, you spoke a little bit in your past answer about our identity and how it conforms with our 2P. Do you agree that our identity has to change to get with the game of the 21st century? No, I mean, I think our, our identity is increasingly a multicultural society that will always have a concern, um, a global outlook and a global concern for international peace, and we should relish in that and think of that as an asset rather than as a as a sort of something that binds or, or constrains our, our options. Uh, I think uh, we, we need to celebrate it and I think uh, Canadian diplomats and, and, and politicians uh, around the globe are still very much respected for what we are viewed as and I think we need to rather than try and, and be something that we're not uh, and by that be very blunt. I mean, try to be, you know, more GI Joe or you know, more, <laughs> more idealistic than we think we are. I mean, no, we are who we are, and, and people appreciate that outside these borders. And we shouldn't try and run away from an identity that's been given to us, or that's been cultivated, um, because it is who we are, and, and that is something that I think we want to use to our advantage. Uh, RTP fits very well in that identity. I think we have a lot of very novel ideas on moving a lot of uh, intractable problems forward and, and we shouldn't be shy away from that, uh, nor should we, I think, uh, you know, pivot our focus onto issues that we think are less controversial and, and by that I actually think, you know, our focus on the Arctic and focus on, you know, uh, these pet projects uh, are, are, I think, putting putting aside some of the big issues because we just, you know, we want to diminish our own kind of uh, global role. Um, so, I don't know, I think that we can we can do more. We are uh, a prominent and I think valuable global player and, and we should play up to our uh, assets rather than hide away from them. Irvin, some final thoughts from you with regards to what Besma Beth, just said? Um, you know, maybe this will be the only small point of de departure, I think we need to move away from an obsession with our identity. Uh, and that goes to the point that, that Canada is huge. It's territorially huge. So how can we have a singular cohesive identity across this huge landmass? And it was never intended to be a single identity. The whole Constitution Act 1867 uh, is a, quite a porous document to, that speaks to the reconciliation of many different identities. The virtue of Canada, Canada today is that we have a, a beautiful political integration project that is able to swallow up new identities that come in and that changes the collective whole. Uh, but that does not change the basic uh, assets that we need to succeed whatever it is we decide to do given our, our, our complicated identity as it were. And those assets are uncontroversial. They require investment. They require analytical chops. They require 
uh, boldness. They require languages, frankly. frankly. But if we're going to talk about uh, core identity, I think we get in a very dangerous place because the the Aboriginal representing any number of hundred, uh, hundred any hundred, any one of uh, hundreds of Aboriginal nations, the Quebec reality, the urban Toronto reality, the Vancouver reality, the Mar these are all complicated. I think it's to our virtue that that we are so complicated internally. Now, uh, can we act as a potent force externally by all means? But that requires that we move away from this idea that we're somehow uh, internationally emanating some sort of uh, superior virtue or some Canadian values. That's a very, very fraught notion. I, I sometimes I worry it tends towards the the, the Anglo-Saxon nation of Canada, where, which is completely at, 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 at in contradistinction to how Quebecers see Canada, how Aboriginals. Let's move away from that and say there are things in the world that Canada can do. If a government wishes to do them, let's let's uh, capacitate them to do that. Right now, whichever gov government which comes to power, whether it's Ignatieff or uh, someone of his international bona fides or whatever one's party, I don't have a party, uh, they are incapable of doing it because there's just no investment on the, on the ex-ante side to, to get things done. We're going to have to end it there. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. We're very grateful here at the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies in Waterloo, Ontario, Bespa Momani, and in Toronto, Ontario, urban student. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll hope uh, you'll join us again in the future. Well done, Zach. Thanks, Besma. Thank you, guys. Bye.